Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov. Today is the first of the month, uh, the month of Tammuz. So, and the Torah portion is Korach, and thank you, Rabbi Murray, for your very wonderful, insightful drash. I had to modify my sermon on the fly, because <laughs> he just said half of it. So, God. <laughs> so I, what can you add to greatness? I'm just going to add some touches, I suppose. So um, the Korach I want to talk about as well, Torah portion. And uh, there is a, uh, you know, Rashi comments on the, um, on the rebellion of Korach when, when first verses that Korach took his, like, all this crowd. Gathering Rashi comments, uh, what were they saying? He quotes Midrash. Midrash uh, Tanhuma, he quotes this, it says, because, actually because the previous, ver the previous passage in the scripture, the previous Torah portion in chapter 15 of Numbers, it ends with the passage of the tzitzit, the commandment to, to wear a tzitzit and to have a blue thread in a tzitzit. We don't have a blue thread right now. Mostly some people do, some people don't, because we don't know how that, exactly how that blue looked like, but nevertheless, um, it's supposed to be a to see it in the blue thread. So this commandment to where it's to see it precedes, immediately precedes the story of Korah rebellion. So they're, they, I mean, we don't see it because we break it into portions. It's like, as if there's a wall between the portions, you can't look in. But you actually, you can. You know, you can actually look in the previous chapter and see what's there. Uh, so the Midrash brings this tzitzit passage, connects it, and says, that uh, Korach dressed his company with cloaks made with entirely blue wool. They came and stood before Moses and asked him, does a cloak made of entirely blue wool require tzitzit, or is it exempt? He replied, it does require tzitzit, fringes. They began laughing at him, saying, is it possible that a cloak of another colored material, one string of blue wool exempts it, from the obligation of Tchelet, and this one that's entirely of blue wool should not exempt itself. Meaning they were, they were saying, it's to comment on, the, on their passage that they say the entire um, congregation is holy. Why do you uh, elevate yourself, Moses and Aaron? And we're all holy. What, you know, you, you, it's enough for you. You shouldn't do that. So the explanation that sages bring, they they uh, create this, this uh, drash, this story to illustrate that. Again, the midrash is not literal. It is not shot. It is not simple understanding of the verse. It's actually, it's a drash. So it's the, you shouldn't, shouldn't interpret midrashes literally. Uh, they're there to explain the text. So the, the story that the, that the sages create is this, about the whole garment being blue and all that. So. Korach, presumably, you know, he wants equality. You know, he's a fighter for equality. Uh, but, of course, in reality, he's not satisfied with his lot. He wants priesthood. Because, you know, who's going to be the leader of, you know, when Moses is deposed, who's going to be the leader? <laughs> in democracy? No, it's going to be Korach. He's just, you know, he, he, he hides behind uh, the, you know, democracy and all that, but, but he's going to... His plan is to use it for his own purposes. Uh, like all the other revolutionaries, you know, what they want, they want what you got. <laughs> they don't want equality. They want to take away from you what, they, what you have. Nothing new under the sun. You know, it's just not being satisfied with their lot. The Tan and Aviram also that join him, they're sons of Reuven. And as you remember, Reuven, Reuven was the firstborn son of, 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 uh, of Jacob, who was disinherited as well. Even though Reuven made peace with his lot eventually, even though first he didn't and he moved the bed of his mom, uh, of Jacob to his mom's tent. Yeah, and uh, well, that, that was the, that's the explanation. Anyhow, so he, he defiled the bed of his father, basically. He was, he was upset that his father moved his bed to the concubine, when Rachel died to, to Rachel's concubine tent instead of Leah's tent. That was humiliating. So Reuben was upset. So Reuben was deposed from being firstborn, and, and these people apparently were also, you know, they were, they were disinherited. You know, they felt that they were disinherited and dissatisfied with what they got. Um, you know, and uh, also the, all these uh, Anshay Shem that joined them, all these influencers, 
of the people, the 150, they also were swayed by the propaganda. I don't know why they got swayed, what was in it for them, who knows, they would remain the same as they were. <laughs> they were men of influence, they would remain the men of influence. I don't know what they wanted, but okay. Um, that was, you know, that's a whole another story. So, um, so those who were dissatisfied, whoever, whoever rose up against Moses or the people who were dissatisfied with their lot and who could not make the peace, made peace with it. Those who desired significance but did not feel they had enough of it or any of it at all. Uh, this, this, this perceive, they perceive themselves disinherited. Kina, the word for jealousy in Hebrew, Kina is, is also the word of possession. You know, Cain was the first person named that way. He is the one who is uh, Chavah's possession, the woman named, named, named acquisition, actually. Cain means acquisition. Um, the, the, uh, Chava named him so because says, I have acquired a man with God. And he, she named him Cain. It means acquisition, so, something to do with possession. So, so kina, jealousy, it's like saying that someone else has what, I, what is actually mine. So they perceived themselves disinherited by others. They wanted to control their own destiny. They wanted to decide whether they are inherited or disinherited. They want somebody else to decide for them and control it. You know, and, and this passage of Korach, the, I mean, it's after the, uh, it's after the commandment of tzitzit, but also it's, it's after the story of the spies. The Bible, put, we don't know how many years elapsed from the story of the spies and the rebellion of Korach. We don't really know. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it doesn't matter because the Bible combines these stories in close proximity to show that there is some kind of continuity. Because spies, they, they cause a rebellion, uh, which lasts in this, all this generation is affected by the rebellion of the spies. And, and by the way, this rebellion of Korach, the 250 that rebelled, and also there are people after that that also were dissatisfied, and also 14,700 of them died later on. Uh, there was a plague, and Aaron stopped it with a censer. Um, that was the last of the deaths that were described of the generation that left Egypt. That was the last rebellion of that generation. Then there will be a rebellion of the next generation, but that's the next one. Right? But this one, that was the last rebellion of that first generation that left Egypt. The next one will be with, ba with Balaam, but that's already the next one. It's already after 40 years have elapsed. But this is the last rebellion. What was the first one? The first rebellion was in Exodus 17. Was the rebellion when they were complaining that they, there was no water. It was at Masai and Merivah. There was no water. And they were saying, is God among us? That was their question. Uh, you know, basically, can we trust God? Or, can we try, or should we trust what, we, what our eyes see? And our eyes see no water. Um, and uh, they wanted to, what did they want to go back to Egypt? That's what they wanted to do. They want to point ahead and go back to Egypt. They wanted, they rebelled against Moses. That was the first rebellion. This was a, this, the, so the, if that was the first and this is the last, so these two are like bookends of, of these rebellions of this generation. It's like brackets. They bracket the generation, the rebellious generation. And, um, that first rebellion was caused by doubt. They are saying, is God among us or not? Uh, and the consequence of that first rebellion was the attack by Amalek. Immediately after they, they have doubted God, Amalek attacked them. Um, and interesting that the gematria of the word Amalek is the same as gematria of the word Sophic. Sophic means doubt. And they have doubted, is God among us or not? They had that doubt. And who is Amalek? Amalek is the son of a princess who, who became a concubine. Princess became a concubine, not Amalek. <laughs> so the princess became a concubine of, 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 uh, of Esau's son Eliphaz. There was, a, there was, a, there was a, a princess of Seir, local princess, daughter of one of those little kings. And she became a concubine, not even a wife of Esau's son. So, so it's a Esau's grandson. Um, and uh, so it's not that he was necessarily disinherited, but there was some, um, hmm, how do you say it? Gosh, the word escaped me. 
Um, I'm like Biden now. Um, <laughs> humiliation is the word. It was, it, was a great, it was a great humiliation for, for, for him, apparently, that his mom, who was supposed to be a princess, became a concubine with diminished rights. Um, and um, so, and Amalek attacks the Jewish people while they're on the way to receive their inheritance. The perceived disinherited person a nation attacks the Jewish people that are on the way to receive the inheritance that they were promised by God. Basically, I don't get mine, you don't get yours either. That's what Rabbi Murray was saying. If I, you know, I don't get my inheritance, nobody gets my inheritance. You know? And that's behind all this spirit of, of jealousy and uh, you know, th this perceived dispossession that, that is in the world today. Palestinian people being the prime example. They're the ones who feel Jews don't belong in the land. They're the ones who have this disinherited mindset. The Jews have disinherited them. And they would rather die than see Jewish people live in peace with them. They want peace. They want Jewish people to die on peace. They would, have, they would rather die. It's like that kind of, you know, bitterness and, and jealousy and anger that permeates. Something needs to happen. God needs to make a lobotomy in that, in that nation, you know, really. Take that brain and replace it with another. Don't know. And so, yeah, and Amalek is father of all such people. It says in Deuteronomy 25, 17, the Parsha Zahor, it says, Zahor et asher asalecha Amalek baderek betzaitam mimitzrayim. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. It says, asher karcha baderek veiznev it says, how undeterred by fear of God, he surprised you on the march when you were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers in your rear. So he, the Amalek attack and, and, and uh, attack all the weak ones and all the, uh, the stragglers who were like, in, like at the end of the camp, all the weak ones. And it's... <laughs> One can wonder if those poor kids of Nova Festival who are dancing on Simcha Torah around the st statue of Krishna are these types of poor people who are, who are weak and weary and don't know their right hand from the left, and these are the ones who the dogs attack. Because they're outside of, you know, they're, they're just outside the struggle. They, they're poor guys, you know, they're you know, weak and weary in spirit. These are the ones who fall first, unfortunately. But interesting that the word for that Amalek surprised you, it's the word karcha. It reminds you of something. Karcha, korach. Karcha, korach. In 1 Chronicles chapter 1, it says this generation of Esau, this is the sons of Esau, Eliphaz, Reuel, Yeush, Jalam, and Korach. Hello. Sons of Eliphaz, Teiman, Omar, Zephi, Gatam, Kinas, Timna, and Amalek. So Korach, original Korach of Esau, is uncle of Amalek. They're not like directly related, but Korach. There's another Korach who's Amalek's uncle. You know, somehow in that generation. You know, Haman, of course, is the one who is the most famous Amalekite, who was not satisfied with anything he had until he saw Mordechai hanged on the tree. You know, he was this quintessential Amalekite. Um, it says in, in, in Jude 1.11, uh, 1, or Jude 11, one, one chapter, it says, Woe to them, talks about these false teachers, false prophets, people who infiltrate the community to take advantage and to just uh, go after their heart's desires, whatever they want. It says, Woe to them, these bad, these bad people. For they went the way of Cain, they were consumed for pay in Balaam's error, and in Korach's rebellion, they have been destroyed. So these three are grouped together, Cain, Balaam, and Korach. These are this unholy trinity <laughs> that, that is grouped together for some reason. Who are these people? You know, uh, what's the common denominator of these three? I think there's, these are like three offices in the governing structure. There is one of the offices of Israel's governing structure is the king, priest, and the prophet. These are the opposite. It's the false king 
Cain, false prophet Balaam, and false priest Korah. Because Korah wants to be a priest. He said, who are you, Aaron? You know, why are you there? I'm, I'm supposed to be there, basically. So I'm the, I need to be the priest, not you. <laughs> so these are the false ones of, the, of, 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 of those that, that feel disinherited and it belongs to them. And, and, and the whole thing with Moses says, tomorrow God will show who is the real one. Let the real, you know, priest stand up. That's what's, what's going to be the, the, the test with the, with the censor, right? <laughs> All of these, they, they wanted to, <laughs> to control their destiny, Korah's rebellion. And it, Jude continues and says, and the angels, talks about, like, first talks about these evil people. And, but then he says, and the angels who did not keep their own position of authority but deserted their proper place, he has kept in everlasting shackles under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. There's some angels also that didn't want that. Who are these angels? What do they want? You know, they want to invade the earth. They want to have children. They like the women. They want to have children on earth because heaven is kind of pretty crowded. You know, some bigger angels than them, I suppose. You know, all the, you know, all the cushy positions have been taken. You know, got to, no, no room for growth. <laughs> got to go to earth and grow there. Got to grow some giants on earth. Right? Uh, and so earth is available. It's a new world, land of opportunity. You know, and, and who was born to them? Nephilim were born to them. And how are they called Nephilim? Anshay Shem. The same word that's used for the congregation of the Korach. He brought 250 with him Anshay Shem. Men of renown. Nephilim were the original men of renown on earth. Those who wanted, who did, were not satisfied with their lot. Or the product of the angels who were not satisfied with their lot. And wanted to and abandon their post. Just like the company of Korah. On the other hand, this, this incident that preceded the story of Korah, the story of the spies, when the spies the, caused the death of this entire generation, then concluded, following their eyes and seeing this neo-Nephilim, because they saw Nephilim in the land, they said, oh, they're, there's Nef Nephilim are there, you know, we thought they're gone. No, they're all there. <laughs> this is where they're all gone, you know. They all went to the land and occupied it. Same way as the original one occupied the earth, this one occupied the land of Israel. Why? To disinherit, presumably, the Jewish people, right? That the, they, they, the people saw the neo-Nephilim and they concluded that it's impossible to, to possess their inheritance. They disinherited themselves. They believed their own eyes. They thought they couldn't control their outcomes. They judged their strength and found it lacking. The biggest of all perceived disinheritance, of course, is the Satan. His, uh, you know, younger brother, Adam... He inherited the land, and Satan got bupkis. I mean, he, he had to satisfy with the position of some worship leader somewhere. <laughs> Being second, you know, just like Korach, by the way. He was, he's, he was a Levite. Levites were worshipers. He says, Moshe said, Rav lachem bnei Levi, enough for you, sons of Levi. Enough for you what? Enough for you, your position that you're in charge of worship. Sons of Korah didn't die, and they became worshipers, sons of Korah. They wrote a lot of psalms. In case, actually, in fact, Haman, one of this, 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 this Haman Asaf Yedutun, out of these three, Haman was a son of Korah, and he had 14 sons who became who made the bulk of the 24 watches of Levites that constituted the, this worship of David's tabernacle. In Chronicle chapter 25, describes these three, Haman, Asaf, Yedutun, and their children. They had 24 kids. In front, in between them, Haman had 14, Asaf had 4, Yedutun had 6. 6 plus 4, 5, 13, 24. These were the kids that assumed the worship of the tabernacle of David. You know... They are the ones who embraced their lot and were satisfied with their lot, and they didn't die. The sons of Korah didn't die. Korah did. You know? Okay. 
Jealousy is the perception of being shortchanged. Why do I feel so? When I don't trust my counterpart and believe that only my understanding, what my eyes see, and my heart feels at the moment. For example, when I perceive work of the kingdom being too costly. Or I see others around me making the most of this land of opportunity and striving for the American dream. When I see the power in the hands of those I disagree with, to say it mildly. Or the power in the hands of the wicked. When someone I love, God forbid, is sick and my prayers are not answered. When I desire significance in the kingdom, and my reality does not match that expectation. No, till trellet, the, the, the blue garment, even the whole garment is blue. Meaning what? To me, I suppose. Trust God, even if all reality suggests otherwise. Even if the wicked one is puffed up and acquires all the possessions and power and bearing all the ways and means of advancement, the just shall live by faith. We're not to imitate the wicked and try to control our outcomes and success based on the measures established by the world or the American dream or various platforms and influences or access to platforms. Lot it says the, that, the, the, that we have the, the blue thread, which I don't have, but the blue thread that some, some have, but used to, it's supposed to be that you look at the blue thread and it says, which means don't walk under your uh, eyes uh, and under your heart, after your heart and after your eyes that, that lead you astray. It's your, your, the blue thread is to remind us not to go astray, not to follow the lead of, not to follow your heart. It says, follow your heart. No, don't. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow your eyes either. <laughs> don't follow those things. Lotaturu. <laughs> Lotaturu. It's like don't walk around, right? And that's the word that's used for the spies. When the spies were supposed to go to the land, they were supposed to latur. And that's, I think that's where tour comes from, tourists. I mean, they were, not, they were never supposed to be spies. They were not supposed to be meraglim. They're supposed to be uh, tourists. They're not supposed to be spies. What's the difference between a spy and a tourist? Both, tour, bo both go travel places, right? But there's a difference. You know, spies, they, weak, they seek out weakness of the land. They seek out how to conquer it and how to harm it and how to, do, how to basically take over. The spies want to take over by force. They're the military company. What do tourists do? They just enjoy it. Tourists just enjoy it. Because why? They're supposed to tour it. Because God is going to give it to them anyway. God promised them to them. They don't have to fight for it that much. You just have to walk in. There's not, there's not much fighting supposed to be. Whatever you see doesn't matter. They're supposed to tour the land. And instead, they, they became spies. Well, here is the other way around. Don't, don't walk after your eyes. Don't walk after your desires that, 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 that leads you astray. Spies reported what they saw. They saw the Nephilim. They saw these giants. It's, like, it's interesting when Cain, when, he, uh, when his sacrifice was not accepted, says Naflupanav, that his face fell down when his sacrifice was not accepted. Who knows what he, what he really wanted behind that sacrifice? But there's some theories. But there were theories that maybe he wanted, they were, you know, he wanted first, first uh, dibs to, to pick a bride. Because what else is there to pick? Everything else is available. <laughs> um, it's interesting that the three things that get that that the the that the world can offer: the lust of the eyes, the lust of flesh, and pride of heart. These three things are the same things that that you know the the three sixes of the of the revelation: money, power, lust. You know, and if. And if, uh, if Cain is after lust and Balaam is after money, then Korach is after power. You know, all of these things, that's what they, what they kind of seek. <laughs> Who knows? Perhaps. Spies reported what they saw in the film. Korach kind of was telling the truth. Yeah, I mean, God have 
separated Moses and all that, but not according to faith. None believed that God had their best interest at heart and set it up so for a purpose. All believed they were shortchanged. Who inherits the land? The meek. The meek inherit the land. Who was the most, the meekest man alive? Moses. Moses is described as the meekest man, as the most humble person in the world. That's what made Korach sin so egregious. <laughs> he said to the most humble man in the world that he elevates himself. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like comparing Sodom and Abraham. That's why Sodom couldn't stand when Sodom was contrasted with Abraham. It's like it, that, that sin that probably in other cases would be just another revolutionary. In this case, looked completely egregious. Just really horrible. Oh my gosh, are you blind? The desire of, of God is for us to be humble so that he can impart what we're lacking and cannot get through our own efforts, no matter how, we, how hard we try, since it's only granted by the Father. What can be granted by the Father that's of utmost value? What is granted by the Father that's utmost value and what actually makes him the Father is sonship. With which comes inheritance and all the other kind of things. Inheritance is a byproduct. Inheritance is not we're after what we're after. We're after a sonship. Daughtership. But we under we after adoption. I mean, we're all children of God, potentially. Potentially, if we make that choice. His offer is extended to all who desire. To approach him through his son, Mashiach, Yeshua. He offers us sonship sonship as well and adoption. So the offer there, it stands. It's all in timing, though. In terms of, like, receiving inheritance or perceived inheritance. You know, we have to wait Moses asked Korach to come in the morning with a, with a censer. Why in the morning? Why not now? We'll give him some time to think it, perhaps. Maybe he'll change his mind. Censer to remind you of Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron who burned when they, took out, when they went out of turn with censer. They burned, so maybe perhaps it's for that. Right? Joshua, interestingly, fought, fought Amalek also in the morning. Machar says, you're going to fight Amalek in the morning. Amalek is fought, fought, fought in the morning. Korach in the morning. A little later. You've got to wait a little bit. So perhaps make it more clear. With time passing, things will get more clear. Inheritance now, when we want something now, that's the way of the prodigal son. Who said, I'll give you my inheritance now. We want Mashiach now. I don't know, are we ready? If Mashiach comes now, are we ready? Or he said, no, no, wait a little bit. I need, I need to put the makeup on. Not me, but <laughs> collectively as the bride of Mashiach. Let's put it that way. You know, we need to be, make ourselves presentable. Fulfillment of desires on our time schedule is the issue of control. And the truth is we don't know when. The meek will inherit the land. Waiting is especially hard with this ADHD, ADHD time when everything is real time. Time is the hardest to control. Perhaps we can somehow give it over. How to do that? How do we put God first and trust in the Lord with all our heart and lead not on our own understanding and what our, what our, eyes, have, what our eyes see? How to do that? I think worship is the key. Why? Because worship inherently makes one second. By being a worshiper, you second by definition. Because if you're first, who you got to worship? <laughs> right? Self-worship is no worship. So worship inherently makes one second place. 
it inherently makes God first. Sons of Kor, you know, they, they, they've, they, got, they didn't die. They got majority of the 24. Where else do we see the 24, by the way? In Revelation, 24 elders, right? There's 24 elders, 24, well, it's 24 divisions of priesthood in Chronicles 24, but there's also 24 people, 24 watches of the tabernacle that David established as well. What do they do, these 24 elders? They worship, right? Is they worship around the throne. Revelation chapter 4 describes 24 elders dressed in white robes. Doesn't say if they have to see them there or not, but they're dressed in white robes and they worship. All the time, right? They worship. They cast their crown. <clears throat> they they fall on their face. They cast the crown. Um, when do they do that? All day. But then they have to stand up also, right? Because like you have to cast the crown. You can only cast it twice unless you put it back on the head, right? <laughs> you have to like go back, so, go go sit back down, right? So how, how often do they cast the crown? It says when the creatures worship God, day and night they worship God, right? What does it look like, though? You have a, and it says they are around the throne, 24 elders around the throne, right? And the throne is in the middle, and there's 24 elders around it. What does it look like? Clock. It looks like a clock. 24 elders is 24 hours. That's why the worship of Levites is 24 hours, right? The worship of the tabernacle is 24 hours. Every hour, they would get up and cast the crown. I, I, I speculate. This just makes sense. You know? It just makes sense. They would do it every hour. It's like the clock strikes, and they do that. It's like, you know, this clocks on the castles, you know? The clock strikes, and all these people come out with the hammers and sickles and and try and, and <laughs> all these figurines and they do the dance and they go back you know but <laughs> it seems like it's that kind of thing only of course glorious in heaven where the clock strikes they all cast the crown day and night 24 hours and what do they say they and <laughs> they do that but also when they worship when they do that the worship extends to God, but it also, worship it goes to, to the Lord, to the ones that sits on the throne, but also to the Lamb. And to the Lamb, they say this. I mean, they cast their crowns. The crowns, they, they signify achievements, like the crowning achievement, right? They cast the crown because why? God is their achievement. All their achievements are to God. They belong to God. These, whoever these people are, whoever these heavenly worshipers are. And then when they see the lamb in Revelation 5.8, it says, it says when, when he has taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the Gdoshim, the incense offering that Moses tells Korah to bring and all these people. And they're singing a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you redeemed for, for God those from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. You made them for our God a kingdom of priests, so they shall reign upon the earth. All the community is holy. All the cloth is made of blue wool. Everyone is a priest. Everyone would be a priest at that time. But on their own achievement? It is, of course, by the work of Mashiach. Who is that blue thread of Tchelet? Why blue thread reminds us of the sea, the sages say, remind us of the sky, reminds us of the throne in heaven. The throne upon one sits and around which 24 elders sit. Mashiach who came is to remind us and to bring us to the Father and to make another, an entire community holy. All the redeemed are holy because of Yeshua, the high priest, owning their righteousness to him, which is the, to which the entire, I guess, in this case, white 
garment of the saint, of the tzaddik, owns its brilliance. Therefore, the only thing that remains is to put ourselves second and God at the head, trusting him with all heart, soul, and strength, and to worship him at all time, 24 hours a day. I think that's what Paul means when he says pray without ceasing. It means all at all, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Give him the glory for all our achievements. And that would make us satisfied with our lot. That would satiate us with God's presence. That would put us in a position of humility. And it will be fulfilled for us what is written, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he will exalt you. With this, let us be encouraged and not rebel like all these guys and not to pull the trigger too fast on certain things. Father in heaven, we, we pray that your worship will permeate all our days, every moment of a day, every second of a day. We will bring you in every situation that we face. We will acknowledge you in all our ways, that you will, and you will make our path straight so we don't sin and keep our garments white. So we don't go after our eyes, after our heart and after our eyes that lead us astray. But we set you in front of us always. And since you are at our right hand, we will not be shaken. So our heart will be glad and the soul will rejoice. You will not abandon us, Lord. You will not abandon us to decay and pit. But you will lift us up and lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Father, we want to lift up Mashiach Yeshua in our lives through that. May that worship give glory to Mashiach and to demonstrate those around us the peace that we have that surpasses all understanding, even in the midst of all the storm and all the calamity that's happening in the world. We thank you, Father, and we bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Shabbat shalom and chodesh tov.